Greeting everyone from the sacred island of the gods here in Bali, Indonesia. I have been enjoying some of the rice patties and the beautiful sunsets and sunrises here as I write my book, Return with the Elixir. And it couldn't be a more awesome, awesome setting to reflect on the conversation I had for the second episode of the Wisdom Keeper podcast featuring Lama Glenn Mullen, a longtime Buddhist practitioner, and I'm so delighted to reflect on what that conversation was like and to share it with you. Now, before I do, let me just frame a little bit of the series of the, the, the Wisdom Keeper podcast. We are going for a deep dive into the subject matter of pilgrimage. I've chosen that to be the launch pad for the podcast. I'm going to do a series, maybe half a dozen or more, on the topic, and I'm really doing that to gear us up for the great and epic pilgrimage that is coming up October 2022, long-awaited pilgrimage to Nepal and India, led by myself, and of course, the exquisite Geshe Tenzin Zopa. Now, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and it is certainly, certainly auspicious given the fact that we have canceled the last two pilgrimages in and amidst COVID and the pandemic. So this is really the disruptive pilgrimage, the one that broke the ice and shattered the deep freeze. And I have been really, really uh, longing to get on the road, which is why I am currently now here in Bali. I think it is ever so important wherever you are to consider that for the last two years of the pandemic where it may have needed, we have needed to be in some sort of lockdown, some sort of restriction, some sort of social distance or isolation that may have impacted us on a more overt level, but certainly has left its mark and its imprint on a subtle level. This goes against our social and mammalian inclination. We are social in nature. We need to be with each other. We need to be amongst each other. We need to feel, see, and breathe with each other, unmasked. And I think many of you will join me in really reflecting on just how necessary it is to break the stalemate of the lockdown that has been internalized. In other words, it is so easy to develop habits. Human beings are in indelibly great creatures of adaptation for better and for worse. So what I'm essentially saying is we have grown very accustomed to restriction and that's not good for us. And we have grown probably more accustomed to being isolated from one another and that is not good for us. And so at some point here now that we are amidst the revolution of 2022 with its cosmic energies, it is time to conscientiously break the stalemate. Wherever you are, and whatever means you have, and whatever your background is, now is the time to begin to extend and breach the secret or hidden walls that have kept you trapped or small or rigid, or convicted, or convinced of no possibility. Now is the time to go mobile. Now is the time to leave a relationship that hasn't served you, leave a job that has been uh, undervaluing you. Uh, make the effort to get going where you have, in a way, succumb to the paralysis uh, now is the time, the energy and the uh, waves of cosmic inspiration are here to catch. And so 
given that it's a new uh, horizon on the on the on a new vista on the horizon i'm encouraging people to really be conscientious and bold audacious and really make that move and so i am looking now in the near horizon just months away from an epic pilgrimage the pilgrimage to end them all or another way of putting it the pilgrimage to break the stalemate after two years we are going all the way up to the Sum Valley in the high Himalayas, to Geshe Tenzin Zopa's hometown, to visit with the wonderful nuns of Rachin Nunnery, and to fulfill Geshe Tenzin Zopa's vision of planting a 500-tree orchard. Then we will spend some 10 days or so going through the Kathmandu Valley to the very, very holy and ancient sites that dot the valley, including five of the sister shrines associated with the Devi Vajra Yogini, which I'm so excited about. Then we will make our way down from Nepal into northern India to cover the holy sites of the Buddha's footsteps and the four major holy sites commemorating his birth and his discovery of the middle way and, of course, his enlightenment and first teachings, and finally his passing. And so I will. I hope that you'll join me. And if you don't join me live, and you could possibly join us virtually because we hope to have a long series of editorials and photographs and possibly live streaming and a lot of barrage of very high quality content coming through the social media channels in a concept I'm calling virtual pilgrimage. That's designed to help you come through the, the new technology on a journey of a lifetime with us. For those of you that can't leave home for whatever reason, the opportunity to be a virtual pilgrim with a living master such as Gesser Tenzin Zopa will be yours. That is now a possibility in the current technological environment, so why not? In light of this exceptional and precious and rare opportunity to go on pilgrimage, I've invited a series of preeminent scholar practitioners who can give us some insight, get our creativity going, get our vision going, make sure that we have some good historical grounding, make sure we get some nice sensitivity about culture and some deep, deep, profound recognition and realization about the power of pilgrimage so that we can really, really appreciate what it means to go on the road as a pilgrim, how to act and see the world as a pilgrim, how to be oriented towards the transition and the challenges of being a pilgrim, and of course, how to return home a pilgrim with, as my book suggests, returning with the elixir for others. And so I'm really delighted to introduce you to Lama Glenn Mullen, who is a Tibetologist par excellence, a Buddhist scholar, a teacher of the tantric school of Buddhist teachings from Tibet. He divides his time between writing and teaching, meditating, and of course leading tours to the power places of the Himalayan region. He's been doing that for some 30 years, and so there are very, very few cats like Glenn, Glenn Mullen out there. What I would consider these guys to be the first generation of Westerners who found refuge early on in their lives when they were teens and in their early 20s, found the lamas, fell in love with the lamas, gave their life over to the lamas, made sure that they were good and diligent students of the lamas, learned the languages, became scholars and preservers of the teachings, but also in Lama Glenn Mullen's case, a very, very adept practitioner, a, a, a yogi, if you will. For, for sure, Lama Glenn Mullen is both a scholar and a yogi. He has written and authored more than 30 books on Tibetan Buddhism, many of them translations of works of the lineage of the Dalai Lama. And so we are in great, great amount of respect to Glenn Mullen for his career and his life's work and his contributions. But also we have an insider's perspective on some of the most subtle, and powerful power tools 
of the Vajrayana. It's called the diamond vehicle of Tibetan Buddhism, including the manipulation of subtle energies and the advanced technologies that are very, very unique to Tibetan Buddhism, unlike anything there is on the planet. How to become a Buddha in one single lifetime kind of power tools. And so we are in very good and qualified hands, both to learn more about Tibetan Buddhism in specific, but also how to go on the journey of the ride of pilgrimage with such an esteemed scholar practitioner. So more about Glenn Mullen can be found at his website, glennmullen.com. I'll have his link in the show notes below. In this conversation, Glenn Mullen and I really start by exploring the meaning and the role that pilgrimage plays in Tibetan Buddhist culture. We have to, we can't forget that for most indigenous and sacred wisdom cultures, venturing on foot to sacred sites has been part and parcel of their experience of sharing the landscape, the physical landscape, with the with the multiverse, the multi-dimensional verse, a world that is inhabited by agencies, spirits, divinities, non-physical beings. And so there's something just very psychedelic and enriching and interesting and really inspiring about the worldview and the role that pilgrimage plays in these ancient cultures. And we break the ice together, really exploring that. And then Glenn Mullen, I asked Glenn Mullen to really discuss and, and flesh out this idea of a tripartite pilgrimage, a pilgrimage that not only ventures forth on the outer level, but also on an inner level. And then it will add a third dimension to it called the secret level. So the outer, inner, and secret forms of pilgrimage, Glenn Mullen decidedly helps us understand the differences and the necessities of those. He goes into a very, very nice riff on the mythology. I, I spur him a little because it's very much part of my interest set. And I think as a society, Western, modern, industrial uh, uh, culture has unfortunately and to our detriment abandoned and lost the mythological perspective and if it weren't for proponents like joseph campbell reviving that and really showing us what we have lost and how we can reconnect with what's lost by venturing back dusting off old old texts going back into our own lineage and our own legacies of the greek myths and having a kind of renaissance similar to the, to, to the renaissance of really respecting what the high periods and the high culture of Rome and Greece part and parcel. Not only did they have philosophy and science, but they had the arts and creativity and mythology and practice and sacred culture and sacred dance. And so this is living cultures and lineages today in India and Tibet do preserve these things, and we discuss those at length. We also talk about a very nice story Glenn brings up about how pilgrimage actually healed and heals sickness. And this is a very interesting story that I can't wait to share with you. Uh, but in a way, I've been saying this for, for a while. I have an article out there written in the uh, Tarka magazine of Embodied Philosophy on how our culture suffers from a paradigm sickness, the worldview of materialism has made us sick, and how I believe pilgrimage is a worldview therapy, a way of healing the deep, severed, dissociated uh, worldview that we have, how pilgrimage and going on pilgrimage helps us reconnect with place and geography and divinity and the unseen world of spirit in order to heal our soul. And so there's a very beautiful story that Glenn Mullen unpacks there. And then I show him some slides, which is one of the benefits if you are watching on YouTube. I have asked Glenn Mullen to go through some slides. I offer him a few nuggets uh, of the wonders of some of the sacred temples and the sacred architecture that dots the Kathmandu Valley. And he, with his vast knowledge and years of experience traveling to these locales, gives us some insider perspectives and some uh, off the beaten track tips and some wonderful history. And so sit back, relax, enjoy the ride, enjoy Glenn Mullen's perspective. He's a wacky, zany, Zen master-like 
uh, cat. He is fiery. He is filled with story, filled with good cheer. Every other, every other sentence is followed by a deep bellowing laugh that uplifts you, but also something very striking and profound. He's a, not shy to share his cultural critique, which I admire and respect. And so we will go through some slides and you will feel like you were there. And hopefully that will lay an imprint on your consciousness so that you feel enticed and connect and enticed to join us on upcoming pilgrimages. And if not, you are starting to create a karmic connection with the holy sites of the Buddha so that one day you do venture forth, noble one, and really put your head on the ground and enter the stream of countless other pilgrims that have ventured to these places over the last thousands of years. It, towards the end of the conversation, we had a very interesting segue into a conversation about psychedelics in both Hinduism and Buddhism. And I recognize that this is a little bit controversial, but I couldn't help myself. I think we have entered a period of tremendous interest in psychedelics. The health benefits and the mental health benefits of psychedelics are now being studied with great depth at the greatest university hospitals in, in, in the West. And I think there will be, without any question, much more cross-cultural dialogue and interdisciplinary research being conducted into psychedelics. And why not bring in the yogis and the contemplatives that knew about these psychedelics? Uh, and my interest in, for example, the uh, psychedelic sacraments in Greece during the mystery schools led me to really ask people I hold in such esteem, such as Glenn Mullen, what the usage uh, and role of the amrita, the elixirs, were these substances sacred, actual physical substances? Are they merely just mental? Uh, what is the um, sort of feel and vibe and attitude towards them in, in modern society and, and the evolution of Buddhism through history? Will we see a kind of upsurge or return to the use of these kinds of substances now that we are undergoing the psychedelic revolution. Finally, we will talk about the Padmasambhava cave and of course those five Vajrayogini shrines, one in particular Glenn Mullen is very well connected to, the shrine of Vajrayogini in Parping, Nepal, which we will be going to when we venture there in October. And so all in all, I asked him just to really open the portals for you to the Nepali landscape, the Kathmandu Valley, its deities and its modes of practice. It's so inspiring. He gives us a little advice on how to prepare ourselves and also how to return. And I couldn't be more thrilled to share this, the second episode of the Wisdom Keeper podcast with Lama Glenn Mullen with all of you. Until soon, enjoy the show and all best wishes. So welcome, Lama Glenn Mullen, to the Wisdom Keeper podcast, and I'm so delighted, first, to see you with your buoyant and lovely energy, and secondly, just to learn so much more about pilgrimage and the power of pilgrimage, and of course, more specificity about the Kathmandu Valley and the secrets of the Kathmandu Valley, and then even further into specificity about Vajrayogini. So thank you so much for finding the time to jump on the, on the podcast with me. My joy, my pleasure, and my honor. <laughs> so let me just uh, uh, frame the conversation a little bit about what, what the, the project is. And we're um, heading to Nepal, hopefully, because <laughs> one never knows these days. We've already postponed for two years, and hopefully things will open up by the end of October in 2020. And we plan to begin a journey, a pilgrimage with uh, Geshe Tenzin Zopa leading us from the Sum Valley, I'm not sure if you've ever visited the Sum Valley, but that's where Geshe Tenzin Zopa's home really is, and it's considered a Baal. So at some point, I'd love to get your comments on what Baal actually is. And from the from the Sum, we'll head into the Kathmandu Valley and um, hit the pertinent pilgrimage sites there, and then from there into the Gangetic Plains, hitting the the four auspicious or holy sites of the Buddha, ending in Bodh Gaya. So in sort of the lead up to hitting that journey, I've I'm I'm speaking with you know some of the most outstanding scholars and practitioners to sort of give us in, insights not only into the historic nature of pilgrimage, 
but also their personal experience and just really helping prepare people so that they can really fully immerse themselves once they get there. And so with such a background as yours, I felt like you were just such a phenomenal guest. Uh, Not only have you led so many pilgrimages, but your tantric uh, scholarship and your practice makes it a really particularly unique opportunity. So thank you so much. Well, as I say, anything I can do to help tune people in to the power of meditation in the sacred places, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to do that. So, Lama, would you uh, maybe begin with some broader general questions before I ask you some more personal ones? Can you talk to us a little bit about the historical precedence of pilgrimage and what it might mean from the traditional point of view, what its importance and significance might be. And then there's the so-called outer, inner, and secret pilgrimage. Maybe you can comment on that too. Certainly. I think uh, all spiritual traditions of the world, all great spiritual traditions, have a long history of pilgrimage to power places or sacred places. <coughs> I think the idea in the Buddhist world is a, a place where any being has achieved enlightenment or where uh, that have become very strong places of practice and meditation over the centuries. That place becomes a little bit like a cloth in which one wraps sandalwood uh, incense. Even after the incense is taken out of the cloth, the sweet aroma of the sandalwood lingers for long. So that uh, metaphor is used in Tibetan literature. So in that way, if we go to a place where great masters of the past practiced and uh, where they gained great transformation and realization, then although they may have passed away 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, the fragrance of their enlightenment energy still lingers. And of course, these sacred places are not just connected with that, because from that time on, say, the places of uh, where Buddha practiced, achieved enlightenment, taught in India, Nepal, and so forth. From that time on, many other hundreds of masters visited, meditated, and practiced. So similarly, you're going to Nepal, the places where Padmasambhava lived and practiced, the great Pamtingpa brothers uh, uh, practiced, and so on. So in this way, uh, we connect with the historicity of enlightenment as a living, continuing tradition. Uh, I once in uh, Toronto, after my 12 year training in India from 72 to 84, I came back and I was living on Toronto Island and there's quite a big Tibetan community. And I asked a local Tibetan who had immigrated uh, to Canada as part of the refugee program, what he missed most about being in Asia. And he said, oh, Nekor, pilgrimage. Because in uh, Asia, every in Tibet, every and Himalayas and Nepal and Buddhist India in the old days, every single village had a kind of a morning evening walk around to the, all the sacred places in that valley or near that village where 2,000 years ago some great master meditated, and then 1,800 years ago some other one, and then 1,500. So it's kind of uh, kind of like a you could say it's like a cruising for a bruising through the <laughs> these wonderful places that put you in direct link with enlightenment as a living tradition. It's not just remembering, oh, Buddha was here. Mm-hmm. But for instance, Bodh Gaya, where I believe you're going, not only was Buddha there, but Nagarjuna did his 30-year retreat in this uh, cave just above the cooling charnel ground about five miles from Bagaya, or maybe seven or eight miles from Bagaya. And he erected those pillars around the stupa and around the tree to keep the elephants from breaking the, the, the enlightenment tree. So we connect and, you know, so then every great master in India 
uh, from the time of those ancient ancient times would try to visit and meditate there. And I have visited and meditated there. <laughs> <laughs> Dalai Lamas have met, lived, you know, visited, meditated there, and so on. So it's a, a continuation of the Enlightenment tradition. That's so wonderful, and and your use of those metaphors. I mean that that will really stick with me. That beautiful uh, incense and wrapped in cloth. Wow, that's so beautiful, Lama. Also, I mean, what is it about the Tibetan culture or the Buddhist culture in terms of their cosmology or worldview that would make even the laity, even 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 some of the villagers who might not be able to make it to Bodhgaya, what do you think it is about their culture and their worldview that just makes a simple walk to a cave in their vicinity so central to their way of life? How, how do you sort of explain that, especially in terms of sort of modern secular culture, having somebody to really, really try to understand what that's about? I think ancient Asian traditions which continue as living traditions until today are very similar to our North American native traditions. In fact, you know, what modern anthropologists think that uh, all of our natives in North Central South America migrated from Central Asia, the Tibeto, Mongol, Korean, that triad of cultures in three waves 25,000, 13,000 and 8,000 years ago. And <clears throat> in that very ancient living tradition, the earth is not just a place we dig up to plant potatoes or dig into to mine gold or silver or copper or whatever. It's not, it is not a mere inanimate phenomena. My very dear friend, Keith Dowman, who's written many books on pilgrimage, one of these ones, if you can get it, uh, sacred or power places the Kathmandu Valley is an excellent, excellent work. And he did another based on Dilgo Kenzie's pilgrimage through Tibet. But he coined the term sacred geography. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest difference. I think a biggest problem we have in the West is that from the time of Descartes in Europe, uh, Descartes sort of is seen as a dividing line where the king owns your body and the church owns your soul. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, we had this idea that heaven is something in your mind and the world or worldliness is the external phenomena. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, I think, the beginning of a very negative trend in our Euro-Christian way of dealing with, if we're going to put it in Christian terms or Jew, Judeo-Christian terms, the creation, like somehow this creation, as Christians and Jews and uh, Muslims can refer to it, is being created by a God. We should have some sort of sense of its sacredness. But from the time of Descartes, that ends. From that time on, that the, the planet is just out there as kind of our little toy to harvest for our own benefit regardless of how negatively we use it and what is the debt, what is the disastrous impact we have upon it. So my very dear friend Keith Dalman came up with this term sacred ge geography. And I think uh, from time of the early immigration, what I like to call the, the, the Tibeto Mongol predecessors. So the early Mongol immigrants to North America. <laughs> the early Tibeto Mongol immigrants in North America. This idea of sacred geography has been there untarnished, never distorted and, uh, and uh, destroyed by the Descartes impact of separating body and mind, physical and soul, heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for all Asians, the earth is a living thing. I mean, where, for instance, when uh, Tibetans travel to pilgrimage to say Mount Kailash, often all the way from Lhasa out to Kailash, they'll prostrate laying their body out on the earth. They'll take a little rock, do a full body prostration, put the rock down in front of them, stand up where they had started their prostration and take the two steps forward, pick up the rock and make another one. They'll travel all the way from, say, Kham to Lhasa to walk around the, uh, 
the sacred sites of, of Lhasa. And when I go to the various pilgrimages I've done around Mount Kailash, you see people going up the mountain like this around the pass of the 18,600 foot pass. Going down during that prostration is even more challenging because they're going down head first. <laughs> And but the, the idea of touching your entire body to the sacred earth, to sacred geography, connects you to that. And every great master who traveled and walked there before, you're connecting with them. You're connecting with enlightenment as a living tradition, the earth as the foundation for everything good we achieve in our lifetime. Any enlightenment we get, any spiritual growth, any wisdom we cultivate, any good karma, if we want to put it in a more conventional term, all comes from us having this sacred earth as our foundation. So I think that's a very, very uh, fundamental difference between Western secularism, where a mountain is just something we can bulldoze to get some gravel or some gold or some silver. In old Tibet, for instance, unless the, uh, and, and, and in Mongolia, unless the earth offers up gold, you shouldn't take it. You know, Padmasambhava in one of his books of prophecies says in the degenerate age, things will get so bad that the earth will not be able to protect her treasures. And aren't we surely seeing that at this point, right? Right. You know, we take these giant machines and just whoosh, build them and just devastate whole areas. If you look at the Brazil and the open gold mines and the South Africa with the diamond mines and so on, just a total destruction. Now, mining is, of course, we want some things and we can mine, but we can do it in a way where we acknowledge the sacredness of the earth and we do it in a respectful way and an environmentally friendly way. And the bottom line shouldn't be the most cost effective way, regardless of how we destroy and pollute and so on. Yeah, so I think yeah. pilgrimage is really reminding us of that. It's reminding me of the uh, comments made by the cosmologist in California, um, Rick Tarnas, who's written an extraordinary book called uh, Cosmos and Psyche. And uh, his, one of his thesis, as you point out in the, you know, the age of reason in Europe, you see this tremendous push for scientific advancement at the expense of spiritual inquiry or contempt contemplation. And he, he references this notion as a, sort of disenfranchisement or what he calls a disenchantment with the world that we've we've become disenchanted we don't have any magic anymore and when you describe this pilgrim or these pilgrims you know making full prostrations in, in what can be weeks or months to kailash the world view that they have seeing that mountain as a sacred mountain the abode of i believe is a chakra samvara i mean we most secular scientifically reductionistic minded people will completely dismiss that as primitive and yet what is the what is the actual benefit lama of what what kind of benefit is retained when you have magic and mythology in your life yeah, i mean obviously joseph campbell was one of the greatest thinkers of our modern era greatest philosophers i would say and his books on myth, mythology, and the power of myth, and so forth, how we connect with the beyond conceptual nature of being, uh, how myth speaks to us in parables. I mean, for instance, most Christians, they don't really know that many things about what Christ said. If we were, take, if we were to take the number of things said by Christ, we can probably write it on a milk carton, I mean, a Sermon on the Mountain, a few other things. What do they most like about Christ? Kind of his sort of little parables, you will, if you will. Mythology is a kind of a parable for a healthy, happy, spiritual living or balanced living. And uh, if we say spiritual, you know, I don't consider myself a religious man. I consider myself a deeply spiritual person. I think religion can easily be a distortion of rational thought or, or clear thinking. So mm -hmm. Buddha, for instance, said, whatever you, with every spiritual teaching, you should be like an analyst buying gold, cut, test, and only if it meets reason, have any acceptance of it. And then if you take it on and you try it and you feel benefit, 
then you can say, oh, yeah, that works for me. Intellectually, it works. Rationally, it works. And when I do it, I feel benefit. So I think, you know, so if we say spiritual, it's in that context. If we say religious in the West, unfortunately, a religion has come to mean something like b blind faith. I'm a believer, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, believing can be silly. We can believe in all kinds of totally idiotic stuff, ideas that meet no reason. And then by believing them, there's very little benefit. So I think uh, if we look at the power of pilgrimage, uh, if you think rationally about what you're doing, you're basically going to a Disneyland of the soul. You know, you're going on a roller coaster ride of the spirit and you're connecting on many different levels. Earlier, you mentioned outer inner secret pilgrimage. On an outer level, you're just connecting with your whole history. And when we lose a sense of our own history, our own ancestry, it's like we're, we're, we've got very little grip on the direction of our life and on the meaning of our life. We basically, just become a blank minded dummy walking around in a stupor by connecting with our history and our, our evolution, if you will, spiritually, intellectually, and so on. That immediately sort of gives us some system of orientation. So for instance, as a young man, I loved boxing and martial arts in high school and college. I still like it very much. I hope you watch the Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder boxing match a couple of Saturdays ago of the best since uh, Ali Fraser. But if a martial artist forgets everything he's ever learned and he has no muscle memory of it, then it's all gone. He's walking down the street and he gets attacked and he's, he's hopeless, he's powerless. So we... Pilgrimage is how we connect to the best of our history. So for instance, uh, I'm up here since uh, I was in the middle of my uh, annual five month teaching tour last year when COVID broke out. So I couldn't go back to Asia because of the lockdown. So I came up to Canada and some friends came to visit. They said, oh, you should take them to the war memorial down at blah, blah, blah. I says, no, thanks. You know, we don't really need to emotionally connect with war as the kind of most important aspect of our life. Pilgrimage is connecting to the la creme de la creme of human experience. <laughs> and when we connect to that, we become part of it. And that aspect of us grows and becomes stronger. So earlier you mentioned outer inner secret. So uh, in Asia, in the Buddhist world of Asia, Asian Buddhist world, um, pilgrimage is considered a kind of a healing, you could say. It's a healing process. For instance, if you, suddenly a doctor tells you, you've got cancer, you've got three months to live or three weeks to live, and we can't do anything. The first thing a Tibetan or a Himalayan or a Mongol will do will say, okay, I'll do a pilgrimage. Because what happens when, when you do pilgrimage? On an outer level, there's immediate change of your whole physical energy your whole sense of physicality changes and a lot of diseases have their root in cellular patterning you could say the way energies flow through our body so when you make pilgrimage immediately those energy pathways are being changed and on an inner level a lot of our unhappiness or our problems in life don't come from us being at a terribly difficult impasse in our life. They come as the Dalai Lama puts it, because we're poking ourselves in the eye with our own finger and saying, oh my God, I got such a poor eye, sore eye. How can I possibly live with such a sore eye? And when we step out of those habitual ways of emoting and thinking and perceiving, and we relax into the kind of expansiveness of the eternity of this world in which we live, the place where we walk, where we put our feet. Immediately, there's that emotional, intellectual, conceptual juxtapositioning. The whole world just melts into a big pool of butter, frozen butter. And we can take that butter and spread it on our delicious multi-grain breads with ease. And it reshapes itself immediately just through the power of 
opening up the opening that pilgrimage does. So there's sort of internal, there's the emotional healing and the intellectual healing. And on a secret level, of course, we, our body and mind are all part of this vast, this vast universe in which we live. And we often think, well, yes, I'm, you know, Dr. Miles, or I'm you know, Glenn this, or I'm Bob that. And we have a very strong sense of this is who I am and this is how I am. But it's not. It's not. It's just a conceptual image we hold of our, ourselves. That's what Buddha referred to as anatma, the non-self, the self we think we are that we are not. <laughs> and when we go on pilgrimage, that sort of crystallized, harsh, uh, concrete sense of our separate self as being exactly like this and exactly like that, like unchanging, fixed, definitely defined who I am. And we touch the earth and we're, we touch to infinity. We touch to a million years ago or a billion years ago. So on the outer inner secret levels, um, pilgrimage has this kind of healing. And about maybe 10 years ago or eight or nine years ago, I was on a teaching tour in the States, my annual five month, four or five month teaching tour. And the daughter of a senator brought one of her friends who was given three weeks left to live. Uh, she had very terminal cancer, and it was of the fat tissue just below her heart on the outside of the, the vein or artery coming into her heart. And they said, we can't do any more treatment, chemo, or uh, operation, and you should just go to a hospice. And she came to me, and I said, well, I'm leaving for Asia. And I did a divination with my dice, clunk, 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 and the dice came up good. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, according to my divination, you don't, if you don't want to die, you don't have to die. Come on a pilgrimage, meditate in the power places, and let your body just totally rethink what it's doing. Get out of the, the sort of rut you're stuck in where your body is just behaving like this and come up. And uh, she said, okay. And then she, came over and joined uh, joined a pilgrimage group. And uh, first I put her on Tibetan medicine for about a month because I was leading a different group at the time. And then uh, and my Tibetan doctor put her, one of the amazing things is when he took the pulse, he said, ah, when it, konshi mogonashi gogimare, really, if she doesn't want to die, she doesn't have to die. <laughs> and he put her on medicine and put her in a retreat for a month until I came back. And then I picked her up and I took her up to the, the sort of healing power places. Uh, um, and when we went in, the, the, the cancer tumor on her, just below her rib cage was sticking out sort of like half a grapefruit. And at the end of the, thing when we came back out of Tibet and back into Nepal it was like the size of a grape and uh she, yeah so then she went back to the states and she lived very well for another six years and after and, you know she was already like late 60s or something like that five years later I told her well I think if you do another tre treatment another pilgrimage you'll probably get another few years about it but she said, well, I feel like I've already accomplished so much with the last six extras I already have. I don't like to push it. <laughs> <laughs> and so she stayed. And I visited, her, I visited her in Boston just like a few days before she passed. She wrote me, uh, uh, I was in the East, and she wrote me, uh, sent me an email and said, I'm a gland. I'm, I'm, I've checked into a hospice, and they, they tell me I don't have so long to, long to live and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well... You don't let yourself slip away until after Losar, after Tibetan New Year. Mm -hmm. And I'll be up teaching in Western Massachusetts and I'll drive down and visit you. And after that, just uh, go whenever you like. <laughs> until then, <laughs> hang in there, which she did. And I've got this wonderful photo of me and her, with her in her hospice, sort of lying in bed and looking out the window very joyfully. So pilgrimage has that ability to physically change the way our physical circuitry is working, emotionally and intellectually totally creating a shift. Now in Tibetan medicine, we say all diseases come through, uh, a, they need a connecting key, you could say, or switch. And our emotions and our thoughts are that switch. And so if we can shift that, we can make a big shift in our whole health, well-being, and so on. And of course, secretly, there's a 
very deep connection we have with infinity and our, you could say, our connection to immortality. Uh, th that story was just phenomenal, Lama. I think thank you so much for sharing that. That is that's the kind of insider story that I think just opens up the possibilities of a deeper, much more rich horizon of what pilgrimage actually means. So thank you so much. And just very quickly following up on that, what 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 was the uh, the medicinal pilgrimage circuit? Where was that? Was that in Nepal? Nepal? The one that you're referring to? Yeah, it started in Nepal, and in Nepal, I put her in retreat in Parping. And Parping, uh, I put her near the Vajrayogini site of the Pamtingpa brothers, which is very famous for its Chakrasambhara practice. And uh, uh, so she did her first retreat there while I was with my sort of formal pilgrimage group in Tibet. And uh, then I had her go and meditate in the Vajrayogini temple uh, once a day and the Pandaji there. Uh, the, the, traditionally, these temples in Nepal are run by a family, their father, son, their pastor, father, parents, daughter, father, parents, sibling, I should say. And so this was under the father. He was still running it at that time. And in the early days, he didn't let any non-initiate meditate in it. But then as uh, slowly as more and more foreigners, the Westerners started doing Vajra Yogini, you just had to say, ah, oh, ham Vajra Vajra Yogini Abhishek Heji, I have the empowerment. And he said, oh, well, come on in. And then when he passed, or when he retired, I don't know if passed or retired, but his son took over and his son was very, has, is very enthusiastic about allowing all international practitioners to spend time there. And he put, sort of set up a special little room where if you want to even spend overnight and he knows you're a serious practitioner, then he'll allow you just to sleep right in the temple, which is very, very wonderful. So that was one. And I hit her also a couple of times a week, go a little bit further up the mountain to Padmasambhava's Enlightenment Cave. There's two Padmasambhava caves in Parping. The lower one where he meditated for three years and the upper one where he's said to have achieved enlightenment. And so I had her visit the upper one. Uh, the lower one is usually locked and it's also kind of so close to the road, it's a little too busy for good meditation. So I had her do it in the enlightenment cave of Padmasambhava. And then there's a temple there owned by a Lama friend of mine who's passed away now, but anyway, his students are also friends of mine, which is the temple of the 84 Mahasiddhas, 84 Tantric masters. So I would do have her do a meditation session in that a couple of times a week, and they would serve her tea and all of that. Meanwhile, she was taking Tibetan medicine, herbal medicines, to uh, encourage those energies to uh, to change their flow. And uh, then later we went to Tibet, and again in Tibet, went to the great places. My favorite in Tibet um, is the uh, Amitayas, the healing cave. Uh, in uh, if you go to Semye and you drive up one of the river valleys about three hours and then you walk about three hours up the mountain, that's where Padmasambhava gave the Amitayas transmissions that became quite popular in the old school of Tibetan Buddhism. So that's one of my favorites. But of course, just in Lhasa, visiting the Chokong and the Potalaha. Again, in Drepung Sera, I don't know if we went to all of them. I think we went up to Drikung, because one of my favorite places in Tibet is Drikung Til and Teardrum, where the early Drikung masters, practitioners of the six yogas of Naropa, achieved greatness, and especially the Anigampa, the Buddha, female Buddhist monks. I don't like to say the word nun, because it reminds me growing up in Catholic, as a pro Irish Protestant in Catholic French Canada, Nuns were always a little bit stodgy and stiff and stern in our mind. Whereas a Tibetan Ani law tradition, Ani in Tibetan Ani means uh, wisdom being. The Tibetan the word for nun, Ani law, means ah is the sound of wisdom, right? Ni is like punctuation of emptiness or infinity, the infinitely wise ones. <laughs> 
which is a much nicer word than saying Buddhist nun, <laughs> where you sort of get the sense of these very stern, uptight, you know, school teachers. I mean, I'm sure many of the Catholic nuns are wonderful and wonderful human beings. Which is, they got that reputation because they were mostly designated as school teachers and the school teachers with a bunch of, you know, roughneck uh, teenagers have to be a little bit stern and tough. So. Anyway, yeah. So that's one of my favorite meditation spots. And uh, on the way out, the cave of Milarepa near uh, Nyelam is one of my favorites. That's where he did his first three-year retreat. And above his cave is Rechungpa. And I'm more of a Rechungpa man than a Milarepa man, I think, in some ways, because, uh, well, Rechungpa was more adventurous than <laughs> Milarepa. So uh, I like his adventurous side. Let me uh, interrupt you because you did mention some of the Vajrayogini sites in Nepal, and we'll 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 get to that in a second. But before I and before we introduce some of the slides and imagery to tantalize some of the viewers here, can you take us back to your first pilgrimage, Lama, and what prompted well, it and what it, what it was like for you? Well, my first pilgrimage in my life was actually to Israel because. Uh, you know, I grew up as an Irish Protestant, Church of England. The only difference between Irish Protestants and Irish Catholics is we Protestants are the ones allowed to wear the condoms. And anyway, so on account of that, I wanted to visit Israel and uh, visit the, the sacred places there. So I think I really did have a, even though at the time, you know, it was just after the, wasn't long after the, the war, this became famous as the Six Day War. And uh, so, yes, I really felt the power of those places, not just because Christ was here or this happened there, but because from that time, well, I would say even before Christ, those were power places with the essence, with the mystical cultures of the Middle East. You know, that part of the world, well, you could say it was a sort of a hotbed of cross-fertilization between Egypt and Greece on the west, and India, Mongolia, China, Korea on the east. So we often think of them as like those old barbarians just sitting there, a bunch of shepherds doing nothing but walking around behind sheep, occasionally having sex with the female sheep if they don't have a girlfriend. But in reality, those uh, caravan routes were open for thousands of years. The oldest Christian church existing is a South India church that in 55 AD was established. So, and long before that, Alexander the Great going over and all of that. But that with Persia uh, as sort of the link between East and West, but the whole of it spilling over into the uh, Philistine area, the Palestine area, uh, Iraq, Babylon, so it was a hotbed of international spiritual culture. So those places that became very famous with classical Christianity were already, most of them, very famous with the mystics uh, of the last several thousand years prior to Christ. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why Christ achieved kind of some, the level of greatness that he did was because he was born at that crossroads of great cultures. But anyway, so that was my first. And then when I was in India. Then, well, what, uh, what, what was it that, that what prompted it? I mean, and how old would you have been? And what's in the mind of a young Glenn Mullen to even hit the road in that way? What starts well, I, that, that motion? Right, after school and after college, I wanted to go to England. My mom was a British war bride and meet her side of the family. And she had been a theosophist and had grown up with a kind of an international spiritual uh, bent, if you will. Uh, you know, her, her dad, my maternal grandfather, had been a major trying to introduce toilets and toilet paper to the Indians. And so they all fell in love with India and fell in love with the whole sort of spiritual legacy of India. And in and especially developed deep love for Tibet and the Himalayas and kind of the young husband expedition of 2000, uh, of 1904 or five, you know, three or four or five, that kind of uh, whole dr drama. And young husband, this Lieutenant Colonel who invaded Tibet 
in that year at the, at the uh, suggestion of the Viceroy of India, later uh, left the army while in Tibet, had a mystical experience and left the army and became president of the Mystical Society of England and went on to write about 20 books on mysticism. <laughs> and this sort of made everyone in England think that Tibet is this sort of amazing place of revelation where even a, a hothead young lieutenant colonel goes in and walks out a saint kind of thing. And so uh, when I was in England, I met a half a dozen people, uh, young students from University of Indiana in Bloomington, Illinois, who were studying with the Dalai Lama's elder brother, Takse Rinpoche, or Professor Norbu, as he used in his published name when he, in his books. And they were going to Darmsla to do a three-month immersion course at a school just being opened by the Dalai Lama. And the minute I heard that, it's like every hair on my body stood on end. And I thought, oh, that would be a nice uh, pro post-grad study. <laughs> so I saved up my shekels and uh, the next spring left to go to India to join that program. And so that's what brought me to Darmstadt. And then when I met the Dalai Lama, he was even more than I thought as a human being. He was just a beautiful, beautiful human being. Very wonderful. He is still a very wonderful human being. But remembering my meeting with him in July of 1972, it was completely knocked my socks off. Until today, I still struggle to put socks back on. <laughs> And then I met his two gurus, Kebji Ling Doji Chang, Kebji Trijung Doji Chang. And they were equally impressive human beings, just very, very beautiful human beings, completely non-ostentatious, non-arrogant. It's not, it's not like, well, I'm the Dalai Lama and I'm the gurus of the Dalai Lama and you're just like this piddly little, you know, flea hopping in from uh, the West, uh, ignorant, little un untutored, unknown, un unlearned and so on. As they just treated us all like we were their own children or their own grandchildren. It was very amazing. There was like, it was like joining, just being coming home after a long period of travel. Then I said to the Dalai Lama, well, I'm not interested in religion. I'm interested in enlightenment. And uh, what do you think? Is that still possible? And he looks up and he goes, hmm, take some effort. <laughs> But yes, possible, possible. <laughs> and the way he said it was completely non-theatrical, but designed to completely like stamp, stamp a, a memory, still photo that you carry in your shirt pocket for the rest of your life kind of thing. <laughs> so, and there, so I, then I just stayed and, uh, and then he said, yeah, we're starting a program at the library and, uh, it starts in September and you got two months to get ready for it. And until that, do whatever you like. And uh, you can, in the meantime, meet the other llamas around the mountain and see if you fit in and how you like it. And if you don't like, then no problem. Bye bye. If you like, stay, study. Okay. <laughs> so I entered the training program and I remained part of it for 12 years. And uh, well, I continued for 12 years. I'm still part of it, you could say, but continued un with unbroken training for 12 years. I would have continued longer than that, but after 12 years, uh, I had to come to Canada for some paperwork. When I was out of the country, Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated and the assassination was sponsored by Indians living in Canada, Sikhs living in Canada. And so then we Canadians uh, for a while, lost our special visa status and also became difficult to get it. So I wasn't, I still continue going six months a year. But anyway, so after living in Darmsla for a year or so, every winter, the Dalai Lama and most of the Tibetans, um, Darmsla is in the mountains and they get snow in the winter and it's very chilly and none of the houses have any heating. And so the Dalai Lama and the older Lamas would all go to either, they choose a place to go. And, you know, that's only like 12, 13 years after all the refugees had come into India and they're scattered all over the country. And so they have no real anchor, you could say. And so every year the Dalai Lama will announce next year I'll go to Bhagaya, or next year I'll go to Saranath, or next year I'll go to um, Patna, like that, uh, Rajagriha. And then other Lamas would all then come at the same time. And for two months in winter, 
the Dalai Lama would go there and then thousands, tens of thousands of Tibetans would come and set up tents and the Lamas would take turns giving teachings and empowerments. And that was so those power places you could say were kind of like the conference center for all the high Lamas and all the refugee uh, community leaders in which they sort of hobnobbed and reconnected and made the plan for what to do for the next year. And uh, of course, once you start studying in the Buddhist world, you learn about the Buddhist tradition of pilgrimage. It just comes up in stories and whatnot. There's no sort of formal training about it. There was no like how to pilgrimage and what about pilgrimage and that sort of stuff. It just comes up in stories and anecdotes and tales of different masters as, as Lamas teach. And so the first one was to Bodh Gaya. And uh, I must say, when I got off the bus in Bodh Gaya, I wasn't sure I was alive. I thought I must have died and gone to heaven because I don't think my feet touched the ground. I was walking like this far above the ground as I was walking. It Really, it did not feel like any gravity. It's like I have to like turn on us i felt like like a space traveler was to turn on your magnetic shoes or you're just going to float off <laughs> such a wonderful wonderful feeling and especially i think uh, of course meditating under the tree and that uh, was very auspicious you know in tibetan they say that dogs in uh, holy places and in in monasteries are often reincarnations of monks and nuns who behave slightly badly but uh, <laughs> broke their vows but are still strongly spiritual people so i'm there meditating with my hands in my lap in the traditional kind of way under the tree and uh this dog comes from behind me up behind me and he puts his head around into my hand then he puts his nose down into my thing and he flips over and lands with his head looking up out of my hands and he's lying on his back in front of me with the four feet in the air going like this and the tail wagging and looking up at me and smiling. I thought, well, obviously I was probably like uh, someone in a past life with that monk who behaved badly and uh, then uh, he you know, went out for a little bit of sex and drugs and alcohol, sex and drugs and rock and roll and weakened his precepts. So he came back at the dog, but he's still good spirited and he still loves sex and uh, drugs and rock and roll. And therefore he did this flip and his legs are shaking and his tail is, he's got this, and I'm sitting there meditating. And then the, the dog sort of gets up and just sort of lays down beside me for the remainder of my meditation. And then maybe a, an hour later, the Dalai Lama comes walking down to the tree because he was staying in the Ladakhi temple not far away. I'm sitting there meditating. And when I see him coming, I start to go up. But he runs up and pushes me back down to, no, meditate. Good. Better. No need. Don't stand. <laughs> so, and uh, when you meditate in those places, again, when we talk about outer inner secret, I think one day of meditating in those sacred places has the kind of impact of meditating for a, a year in an ordinary place. I mean, one goes into such a deep, deep state of meditation. It really is very, very astounding. So I loved the meditating under the tree. And those days, Bagai was very rustic. And now it's very built up because Tibetans started going there every year. And then when they would go, then all the Tibetan uh, Himalayas, thousands of people come down from Sikkim and Bhutan. Like that first year in Bagaya, or maybe it was, yeah, the first year in Bagaya, Kebji Ling Doji Chang, Dalama's great guru, was giving Yamanteka empowerment. And so the king of Bhutan came down with his two wives, his Tibetan wife and his Bhutanese wife. And one of the kind of Sikkimese kings came down. And so all the business people from all those Himalayan kingdoms came over. And of course, then when they're there, they'll all, you know, in, spend some money investing in, you know, building, a, let's get a little piece of land over there and build a temple. And so year by year, this kind of energy that Tibetans put into those places took it from a place that had been almost lost because of the Muslim occupation of India from the 10th century, 11th century on and uh, sort of just lost. And now it's like totally a bustling 
Buddhist capital of the world is sort of turned into the Vatican, if you will, or something like that is very, very amazing. And especially I love in Bagaya, uh, Nagarjuna's cave where he meditated either three years, 30 years or 300 years. The jury is out on which of those three he did. <laughs> uh, let's say three, although Tibetans say 300, but then, you know, what's time? Yogo Kenzi Rinpoche, the late great former head of Nyingma, I want to put it, time is whether this, this came up in a uh, forward he wrote to a biography of Padma Sambhava. Was he in Tibet for three years, three months, three years, or 30 years? Because there's 12 biographies and nobody agrees. Was Padma Sambhava in Tibet for three months, three years, or 30 years? And Yoga Kinsey said, well, it doesn't really matter. In the fourth time zone, when past, present, and future all stand still, time becomes a totally stretchy stuff. And so, uh, yeah, meditating in that cave is wonderful. But, you know, it's a long walk in the hot sun. In those days, you could rent an elephant for six, 650 a day from the local Maharaj. He had an elephant. If you visited him and he liked you, uh, he would say, okay, if you want, if you want to visit, you can, you can take my elephant. Uh, I forget, I think he charged like, in, the, in those days, it was like 100 rupees or something whatever the rupee was at that time, maybe, I think it was 50 rupees, which at that time was about uh, $6.50 or something. And so then uh, we went on the elephant the first time. Next time he wasn't renting his elephant anymore because the elephant had gotten a little bit old and a little bit sickly or something. So the walk was more intense. Poor old Bob Thurman went when he was there in 78 and he, I'm down under the tree with him and we're meditating and one of his kids runs up and says, we're, we've, we've got the elephant, you have to come with us. He says, no, I'm gonna stay here and meditate with Glenn. And uh, Nana said, no, Bob, we are not going on this elephant without you. She was a little nervous. They got halfway there and the elephant started jumping up and down trying to buckle them off, I guess. <laughs> it wasn't so happy. <laughs> with all, all Bob and Nana and their four kids all chatting away. <laughs> Amazing. Must Amazing. Have been, must have been something they said. <laughs> Set them up. You know, you, Glenn, you mentioned this Nagarjuna cave twice. I've, I've been to Budgaya nine times, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the cave that you're referring to. It's not the Mahakala cave where the Buddha received uh, his rice porridge from Sujata, right? That's not the one you're referring to. There may, uh, well, it is referred to as a Mahakala cave because that's where Nagarjuna had his vision of uh, Sikta Gompo Chakrupa, six, six arm Mahakala. As you know, there are eight main forms of Mahakala. Each one is associated with one of the eight great charnel grounds of India. So it might be referred to as Mahakala cave. Uh, it wasn't when I went there, it was referred to as Nagarjuna. And below it in the old days was where all the people who died in the Bhagaya area, the bodies would be laid out there uh, to be eaten by the wild animals of the jungle. Because uh, in uh, India with early Buddhists, if you died, then uh, you have an astrological divination done. Should you be buried and offered to the bugs of the earth, the worms of the earth? Or should you be put in water, fed to the fishes? Or should you be cremated, uh, offered to the uh, fire fire god, Agni? Or should you be left out in the open sky for the wild animals and birds to eat, offered to the air, the forces of the air? So they do a divination or an astrological chart to see which of the four elements uh, was your strongest character and which would, if you were watching your body go that way, which would you prefer? Some people, if they see themselves being eaten by worms and all of that, worms crawling out of their ears and their nose and their mouth and buried under the ground, they go, yak, who did this? <laughs> and other people, if they see fishes nibbling away at their toes and the such, they think, what, what? I don't like that. Or uh, fire, what? You're burning me like I'm, like I'm a piece of old used toast. Or something. So they would do a divination or an astrological chart for which of, was your strong element. But uh, for most people who ate meat and Buddhists in India were all meat eaters. 
until very late, I guess, when Hinduism started rearing its, uh, bringing its bad habits into Buddhism. So they were all meat eaters. And uh, so there, during your life, you've eaten meat from time to time. And so then when you die, if you offer your body to the carnivores by leaving it out near a forest or a jungle, that would be very wonderful. And they do that in Tibet also down until today, still they have what they call the chador, the bird offering gift to the bird sites. And when you go to any Tibet area for all the way from the borders of China, all the way up into Ladakh, every village will have a chador, chador, chador uh, pune, uh, bird offering site where the bodies are laid out and the flesh stripped a little bit and the vultures will consume it and then the little sparrows will come in and pick up the little nuggets and so on. So, so is that cave, am I misunderstanding uh, that the cave in which the Buddha discovered Middle Way before his enlightenment, that cave, particular cave where he gave, gives up the asceticism, outside on the outskirts of Budgai. It's not the same cave. There, There's a separate cave for Nagarjuna. Well, where he gave up aestheticism, the, in my, you know, because I, what I know about there, I went there all during the 70s, most winters for the 70s, we go down there because Dalai Lama would either go to Varanasi or Budgai, or sometimes South India. But so the half dozen or so times I went to Budgai was in the early and mid 70s maybe one in the early 80s, but I don't remember exactly. But the place where he did his asceticism, when I went there, uh, they, in olden days, you dug a hole in the earth straight down about 10 feet. And so, because um, then it, that way it's cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And so Buddha's little hole in the ground, it's like a tunnel almost like a well going straight down about 10 feet. And according to the story, when I was there in, I guess, winter of 72, three, or uh, maybe 73, four, I can't remember which one. That's when I first visited that place, one of the local monks, I think it was a Sri Lankan monk, uh, took, us, took me and a few friends of mine to visit that place. And that's only about two or three miles from the tree and it's near the banks of the Naranjana rivers. Whereas the cave, you cross the river, you go the other side of the river. So near the Naranjana river, and there's a little village and outside the village, there's a, just a hole in the ground. That's about a meter. If I put my hands like that, you can't tell. <laughs> so like, ooh, go out for like <laughs> a little over a yard wide, and say a meter or 40 inches or so wide and straight down for about six or eight feet. So apparently in the time of Buddha, it was very common for meditators doing long meditations to build themselves a little things like that. And then you could just above the opening, you could just put up like a little umbrella kind of a thing. Just You could just make a little roof on it. So if it rained, you didn't get flooded. And uh, a little ladder to go up and down into it. So you get in there and you wouldn't be able to lie down. It wasn't big enough to lie down. You could just sit, meditate. You know, when you went to sleep at night, you just lean against the back and stretch your legs out in front a little bit. So that's where Buddha is supposed to have done his six year of, of strong, uh, intense practice on the banks of the Naranjana River, as it's said in the epic poem of his life by the first Dalai Lama or is that in the Lalita Vistara Sutra, the, the, tent, the, the, the mystical theater of the life of the Buddha. And uh, so, the, so it's not a cave, it's really a, rather than a hole in the wall restaurant, it's a hole in the ground bed and breakfast place. <laughs> and then when he came out of that, that's when uh, Sujata brought him the milk rice one day and he ate that and that gave him so much energy that he walked over to the tree uh, a mile or so away, mile and a half away, maybe something like that. And that's where he sat in meditation for the times and went through the three watches of the night and achieved enlightenment at dawn. Mm -hmm. So Nagarjuna's cave is about another five miles past that. Well, I don't know, three or four miles past that at least. 
So that's a wonderful little seed in our minds now because I wasn't aware of it. And since you've spoken th three times about it, I, we'll, we'll have to find a way to check it out. Lama, I know you're pressed for time. I'm going to show some slides. We don't have to do them all. I'm going to show a couple and maybe we can, maybe your commentary can be more on the uh, yogic side of things. Um, certainly we'll, we'll be led by some historical guides that can give us some information, but maybe you can help us with the the more mythological and the uh, practical or practice yogic practice side of these places and any impressions, memories that are uh, jogged as a result of seeing the images. Images are so powerful. I'll just lo I'll lo I'll load that up here. And there's quite a few of them, so we can skip over most of them. And maybe, maybe you can just talk about a few in Nepal, in particular the Vajrayogini. <clears throat> Let's see. So right, as I'm, right that's as, that first one you saw is the tree of enlightenment in Bagaya. Yeah, we'll get there. So uh, this is the Sum Valley where we're going to start the pilgrimage. And I'm just going to, and this is Kopan where we're going to stay in the Kathmandu Valley. And this is this is then the uh, Bodhna Stupa. There's a few here that I think maybe just will pop up out and you can just go ahead and launch right in with your first associations. <laughs> yeah, so here with uh, uh, Bagaya, Tibetans refer to Chonan Champa, the great stupa. Now, this is east of Kathmandu. And uh, when the Tibetans came into exile or fled the Chinese communist invasion of Tibet in the 1950s and then 1959 when uh, China cracked down and tried to assassinate the Dalai Lama. So all the, all the, uh, it was a mass exodus. At that time, this was all farmland with just a stupa standing at the center. There wasn't a single building around it, uh, except for a little village farm. So as far as the eye could see, all of those buildings you see in the photos were all just farmland, really until uh, 1980 or so. It was almost all just farmland. But uh, this place had been used uh, by the Tibetans as their trading center. So Tibetans from the time of, say, Songsen Gampo on, when Tibet became officially a Buddhist nation, uh, and long before that as well, I'm sure before that, this was the Tibetan campground when Tibetan caravans came to trade in, in Kathmandu, and they would bring down furs and butters and salt and so on from Tibet and other uh, other probably gold and silver because Tibet had a lot of those just emerging from the earth. And they'd, they'd tent around the stupa. So this stupa is often said to Keith Stallman wrote a wonderful book on a called Legend of Great Stupa and the story of the grandma who built it. And she went to the king and said, I want to build a stupa with my sons and the king said, okay, I'll give you a piece of cloth and I'll give you that much land. And she gave him just like a shawl, like, you know, just like a, a meter square, a couple of meters square. But then she was very clever. So she took out all the threads and did a very loose weave. <laughs> so that well, one or one and a half meter square shawl suddenly became like a couple of hundred yards. <laughs> And based on that, she built this stupa, started this stupa. Now, Kathmandu became officially Buddhist about 250 BC when King Emperor Ashok, or King Ashok, the Buddhist, the king who made Buddhism the national religion of India, and he conquered and united India for the first time in its history. He sent his daughter to Kathmandu to uh, sort of um, make, bring, to build some stupas. So the stupa, she built four stupas, one at each of the gates to Kathmandu city, which starts about a mile or so west of here. And she built four, one at each of the four gates. And one of them, the one on the eastern gate, still stands there, or at least a replica of the original, which is wonderful to visit if, if you can. When you drive from Boda into Kathmandu and you come to Ring Road, you turn left and it's just about a half a mile along on your right going clockwise around Ring Road. But anyway, so then from 19, 
uh, mid 60s, Dilgo Kenze settled here and Dujum Rinpoche, the great Nyingma Lama, Ergen Toku, one of the Kargyu, Karma Kargyu Lama, various other Lamas started and they all started uh, visiting Taiwan basically and where there were a lot of Tibetan Buddhists because Chiang Kai-shek after communism take over China and uh, Chiang Kai-shek and his whole group were exiled to Taiwan or were allowed to go to Taiwan and not be persecuted or uh, attacked by the communists. And uh, Tibetan Buddhism had been the court religion of China from the time of Kublai Khan, so from about 1250 until modern times. So there are millions of Tibetan Buddhists throughout China, largely Tibeto-Mongol Buddhism, we can say. And uh, so Jogo Kenze, Dujam Rinpoche, or again, these guys started traveling to Taiwan a lot and gathering offerings from uh, wealthy Chinese families in, uh, in Taiwan and started building their monasteries around the stupa. And then uh, people started building like those little houses to looking out around the stupa. That's all those are all new built in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And then the whole town around it with everyone and their uncle trying to get, you know, $50,000 to put up a little building and rent out some apartments and all that. So it's one of the most sacred places and beautiful places. And if you go to Kopan, you basically at the angle you're looking at here, you turn right and just walk straight up. It's about a half hour, 45 minute walk or in a taxi, it's a maybe 10 minute drive or something. It's a very slow drive because a very tiny little roads with lots of uh, potholes. So Kapan is uh, you know, built by Lama Tupinyeshi, one of the great uh, Lamas of coming from Tibet, a real Mahasiddha, a great uh, Chakrasambhara Vajrayogini practitioner. And they've got about 300 young Tibetan monks, mostly from the Mount Everest and various regions of Nepal, Tibeto, Tibetan regions of Nepal. So Nepal was really in the olden days, 18 or 20 different kingdoms, independent little countries until about midway through the 1600s, the Hindu king of Gurkha, one of the Northwest uh, kingdoms, built a big army and gobbled up the other kingdoms one by one by one by one. So about a dozen of those kingdoms on the north of various sizes uh, are still Tibetan Buddhist. And in ancient times where uh, many of them were part of Tibet in, uh, before Kublai Khan, before Kublai Khan, say from 650 until about uh, 1200 or so. And so Tibetan language is spoken in many of them and many of those little valleys, including the one you're going to, uh, Geshe Tenzin Zopa's homeland, then that will have a lot of people who speak Tibetan and that probably still speak Tibetan up there. If not, they speak a local language will have many Tibetan words in it and will probably have a connection to the Tibetan Buddhist world with various local temples and uh, lamas and so on. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a wonderful place to stay. Uh, they have a big sign up saying no sex and no meat and no alcohol. Mm -hmm. so the, the three pleasures of manly, manly, li manly uh, living of Mahasiddha living uh, don't happen up there. So you have to walk outside the gate at night to have a drink and make love to your favorite lady love or man love or whatever you have. <laughs> but anyway, they have 300 monks in it and down below it at the bottom of the hill, like a few hundred yards below is, a, is their nunnery, their anigampa, the wise being retreat, which has about 350 young nuns. Yeah, this is, this is the nunnery. This is a, this is where we're actually staying and uh, have a nice connection with the nuns. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, we we were there in 2018 with our group during the Geshe Ma debate sessions, and there was 700 nuns gathered there from all over the Himalayan region, hosted by the Kopan nunnery. It was wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, you know, most very few of them are from Tibet, so, so most of them are from those little valleys that. You know, they're kind of bayul, like hidden, hidden mystical lands. And uh, they've remained Tibetan Buddhist in character for the, you know, 
better part of 1500 years or more, some even longer than that from the time King Ashok brought Buddhism to the Kathmandu Valley and then uh, it spread from Kathmandu. Much of Tibetan Buddhism, of course, comes from the Kathmandu Valley because it was one of the direct routes to Tibet. And so many of the early teachers going to Tibet either were in Kathmandu or lived in Kathmandu for many years or traveled from Kathmandu. So for instance, Padma Sambhava, who came to Tibet a hundred years after Buddhism was the national religion. So sometimes he said to be the founder of Tibetan Buddhism, which is kind of nonsense because uh, the country was already officially uh, by law Tibetan Buddhist for well over a hundred years. But anyway, his enlightenment occurred in Parping in Nepal, not far from this valley. Pamtengpa brothers who, you know, were the great inspiration of the Sakya school of Tibetan Buddhism. And of course, Marpa went through there many times and Rechungpa went through there many times and uh, many great, great teachers. Let me just forward here because it looks like uh, <clears throat> uh, this is Pashupati Nath and this is the Tilopa cave there. I'm not sure the Naropa or Tilopa cave in Pashupati. Is that a site that you have visited before? I've been to Pashupati Nath. I especially like going there in November because that's Shiva Ratri. And when I went to India in uh, 1972, there were 13 million of these Shiva Babas, as they call them, the, the hashish smoking Hindu monks. And so th this is the burning ghat in Pashupati Nath. And non-Hindus are not allowed inside the temples, but you can, uh, you know, stand above the burning ghats and, and look down. And the one running that, the old Hindu monk running that, he's a very strong hashish smoker. So Keith Dowman, my old, uh, very dear old friend in Kathmandu, used to like to go and smoke chill and smoke hashish with him late at night. And uh, being a, it was officially closed with uh, at that time. So then as the, if you're the guest of that head monk. So very often the head monk there will smoke a, you know, hashish is sacred to those Hindus. And so in Shiva Ratri in November, the full moon of November is when uh, some millions of the Shiva Babas, the Hindu monks, hash, hashish smoking Hindu monks gather in the Himalayas and gather their year's supply of hashish. It's not legal for non-Shiva monks, but it's a legal sacrament for the, for, the, for the Hindu monks. So the old monk who runs the burning gap, before he lights each fire, he goes into his temple and he lights a chillam and smokes a hashish chillam and goes, Namo Shiva Bhagavati ba ba ba. <laughs> Yells at the top of his lungs and then goes out and invoking Shiva in that way, goes out and lights the funeral pyre of whoever is being cremated. Anytime you visit there, there'll probably be four or five or more people being cremated. If you go in the morning, they usually start the cremations at about six or so in the morning. And, uh, until today, you know, with the Shiva Babas, they, uh, when you're a Nath Baba in training, you wander to the eight great Shiva grounds. And uh, therefore, some of them are over in Kashmir, some are in South India. So for 12 years, these guys wander between the eight great Shiva grounds, smoking their hashish as they go and then uh, doing their sadhana, their, their daily practice. So it's a very wonderful tradition. Uh, we used to get a lot of them coming up to Dharmsala in November to gather their annual supply of hashish. But uh, Indra Gandhi didn't like them, didn't like them. So she sort of pushed to cut their numbers down and started a public campaign about evil kidnapping Shiva Babas and so on. It's sort of uh, really, really unfortunate because one of the great mystical traditions similar to in the Southwest, you know, our native people, the Pueblos and the Hopis who take ayahuasca, not ayahuasca, mescalinto, or the North American natives up in, uh, you know, Washington state or up in Western Canada who take magic mushrooms and so on. It's along that line of mystical endeavor. Well, since you're on that subject, Lama, let me ask you what the, uh, what the Tibetan or the Vajrayana perspective is on hallucinogenics and psychotropics since they've become they're heading into a huge renaissance now. And I, I, you know, from your point of view as a practitioner, 
where where are the lines and how is that seen from from within the tradition well uh, uh, tibetans are are really you know whiskey drinkers uh so for them hallucinogenics aren't aren't very big i think monasticism in tibet sort of brought an end to that but we can see it was clearly the case in india with the mahasiddhas that they were they, many of them relied upon hallucin hallucinogens, and we see this mentioned in Guya Samaja tantra, tantra, where it's said that there's five ways to develop clairvoyance. The best is meditation. Through samadhi, you can unlock the powers of your own samadhi, so you can remember your past lives, read the minds of others, and so on. Second best is dream yoga. Uh, because that's the reason a second is because you can only you only become clairvoyant when you're asleep. <laughs> hey, you've got to be able to go to sleep if you're suffering from insomnia. <laughs> and third best is uh, hallucinogenic. And so it was obvious uh, that it was there with the Mahasiddhas in India in the olden days. And it's still very strong with the shamans of Nepal that are closer to the early Indian Mahasiddha tradition and with the Shiva Babas who are closer. Now the Shiva Babas mostly rely upon datura, a kind of a morning glory seed kind of thing, a flower that the seeds are very hallucinogenic. And so they largely rely upon that one. Although in Nepal, there's a lot of magic mushrooms amongst the shamans. As, as with the shamans of uh, Buryat, Eastern Russia, they also use a lot of uh, magic mushrooms for their uh, clairvoyant, hallucinogenic, immersive states, you could say. But in Tibet, I'd say monasticism sort of reduced uh, use of any substance. And when you, once you say the best is meditation, second best is dream yoga, third best, nobody wants to be third best, right? <laughs> like winning the bras in the, in the Olympics. I mean, it's better than nothing, but you know, not as good as silver or gold. So I think that kind of in the Tibetan world sort of discouraged it. Although, you know, one of my lamas, uh, Geshe Darge, who Dalai Lama appointed to teach to us uh, foreigners in the early seventies, when he taught us uh, the Tandra Kirti's guide to the middle way, Umala Jukpa, he pointed out that there's a stage, there's a verse in there which talks about wisdom and experience of emptiness that mentions uh, um, mentions the Torah as being one of the way, may, ways to get experience of emptiness or infinity or ultimate level of reality. And when he was talking about that, uh, Geshe Darge laughed and he says, yes, in the village I grew up in, that was quite common, commonly used by some of the meditators and mystics, but it wasn't, wasn't, uh, it wasn't what you call acknowledged by monks, the monks, the monastic community didn't like it. Now, when I met Dalai Lama, at the very first time when I met him, actually someone asked him about hallucinogenics, about LSD, hallucinogenics, and he laughed and he said, well, Many Western people who come to Buddhism become because of an experience of shunya, uh, emptiness, ultimate reality, that they gained while uh, on the LSD experience. We said, obviously, it has some positive power. And then he said, however, you may find if you meditate a lot, it's unnecessary. You can get the same experience through meditation. And he said, if you continue meditating, you might find it's even a distraction. But then he laughed and he says, but anyway, that's just from theory side. He said, I've never tried it myself. Mm. <laughs> I have no experience for his words. <laughs> so so you're saying the uh, the fifth precept of intoxications is there's how, how, how does one work around that or with that or interpret that? Uh, well, is, it a, is, is it is it is it is is it a completely different thing when you're talking about Mahasiddha tradition, ta the tantric tradition, uh, right. Amrita? Right. I think. Well, you know, my own opinions on Buddhist history aren't really uh, don't really adhere to the mainstream way of writing it because, in my opinion, Buddhist monks tend to whitewash history and rewrite history to suit what they think think how they think things should be 
And uh, I like to continue that tradition of rewriting history to suit how I think they should be. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, in the beginning, you know, why, where did alcohol come up and how did we have a split between Hinayana and Mahayana? And it came up through these uh, 10 little points of debate. And one of them was there was the sap of a tree, which if you, you know, if you collect the sap in the morning by mid afternoon, it becomes slightly alcoholic. And so could this be drunk or not? So certainly in the Buddhist tradition, the only reference is to alcohol, not to anything else. So anyone who includes anything else is basically, they're including it because they want to include it. It's not including it because it was there. It's like if I tell you, don't take aspirin, and then suddenly you include everything else that you think is in the same category. Hmm. So the, the early statement on it by, by the early Avinia masters is that monks and nuns shouldn't drink alcohol. Why not? Because once upon a time, uh, what is it? Once upon a time, there was this monk walking along the road and he, he was kidnapped. And the kidnapper said to her, okay, you've got, said to him, you've got a choice. You can either kill this goat, kill and eat this goat, have sex with this beautiful woman or drink this alcohol. And so the monk thought, well, killing a goat is killing, that's quite serious. Uh, having sex with the woman, that's breaking my vow of celibacy. So I guess the least of the three would be to drink the alcohol. So then he drank the alcohol. And then, of course, the lady started looking more pretty. So then, of course, he had sex with her for a couple hours. And that made them both very hungry. Then the goat started looking more delicious. So then they killed and ate the goat. So in that, <laughs> if you ever find yourself in that position where someone kidnaps you and says, would you like to kill the goat, have sex with the woman or drink the alcohol? The alcohol seems to be the, the less morally transgression of precepts, but it carries the greatest risk of continuing into the other two. So start with the lady right from the beginning. The goat may survive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we're looking at the cave of the the, the Mahasiddha Talopa, and is it would it would it be your view that that entirely possible that the Mahasiddhas Naropa Talopa may have engaged in psychedelics? Very possibly, certainly, because in Nepal at that time, many many people do, especially magic mushrooms and uh, magic mushrooms and the Torah were the two very big ones that are used by many, many of the shamans. And there's no reason to think they would have included those. Now, strangely in Tibet, you see, uh, because the split, as I was saying, between Hinayana and Mahayana in the early days came over the alcohol business. And uh, the Mahasangika, the majority said, we're drinking that liquid, you guys like it or not. And so they split off and they're called Mahasangika, meaning the majority. So 90% said yes, 10% no. The 10% who said no became the Hinayanas, the small quorum, the small Sangha, and the other became the Mahasangika, the great Sangha, the 90% and the 10%. So it's a little bit like America, the 10% of Puritans who came to North America and the 90% of non-Puritans stayed happily in Europe. And then encounter that until today, America is still a puritanical nature where you can only sell a car if you sit a naked woman on a half naked woman on it and uh, have her holding a glass of wine at the same time. So you're, you're getting both sex and alcohol and maybe you're having a hamburger sitting on the hood that you can eat as well. So you get all three from the Buddhist um, story <laughs> because of puritanical nature, then buying that car is the forbidden fruit. You'll have the woman and the meat <laughs> and the alcohol. Yeah, so it's very possible that uh, Naropa Tilopa did visit that valley. It's not mentioned in Naropa's biography, and it's not mentioned in Tilopa's biography, but there could be some oral tradition of it being there. And of course, there is a temple dedicated to them. And even if not, 
uh, one of their great disciples probably did or one of the lineage masters holding the lineages from them. So very often with these sites, it's hard to say if it really was that in ancient times or if later on, you know, local Pandijis just started linking it to that, to mm -hmm. that master and it just caught on and people liked the idea and it just continues. So yes, uh, I think it's possible that they, uh, not, more probably Naropa than Talopa, I think, but you know, if anyone goes to Lumbini, Buddha was actually born in Nepal, not in India, although at the time of Buddha's birth, India was not one country and Nepal was not one country. India was maybe 200 countries and Nepal was maybe 25 kingdoms or 50 kingdoms. We don't really know. So uh, anyone going to Nepal to Buddha's birthplace might have wandered, might have continued up into the mountains to Kathmandu you know, by caravan, it's probably only about a, a week or 10 days of travel. It's not like a big deal. And the many sacred sites up there connected with history might have enticed either of them to go up there. Uh, one doesn't know. But as I say, it's not mentioned in either of their biographies, but many, their biographies in Tibetan were quite short. Telop mm -hmm. is very short, Narop is a bit longer because there's uh, sort of one put together from the stories brought by Marpa. Thank you, Lama. Let me, let me just flash ahead here to, uh, we'll skip some of these sites, although I'm oh, sure they're very... That's Swayambu one. Go back to Swayambu. You like yeah. Swayambu, huh? Okay. Yeah, that is my favorite place in Nepal. Well, no, in the Kathmandu Valley. This is my favorite. And, you know, underneath this is the cave where Nagarjuna went to... Uh, receive the Pragna Paramita teaching. So according to the Buddha's life, when Buddha became old, he couldn't pass away till he had produced 500 arhants, 500 enlightened beings. And then when he passed away, he commanded 16 of those to manifest the power of immortality and remain until Maitreya showed up. And so each of them was given his own secret mountain or sacred mountain. And to go there, and each of those sacred mountains had underground caves leading to right under them. So to get to this underground cave, which is right under Swayambu, when you drive to Parping, you go out through a valley. And that's where the river Manjusri cut them when all of Kathmandu was underground, it was underwater. There's a big lake. This was a little island in the middle of the lake, and a Buddhist stupa was built there. And the mountain looked like a stupa, and then they put a Buddhist mound there with a, the bones of a great saint in it. So according to that story, then uh, later Manjushri came along and thought, oh, this would be a nice place to have a bayul, a mystical valley filled with saints. And so he took his sword, and cut a little, oh, what do you call, crevice in the side of the mountain leading to the southwest, I believe it is. If you go straight on to the right here, about a couple of miles, you come to it. And if you take the bus to a Parping or a, a vehicle to Parping, as you go through there, you can stop and get off where the bridge is and you can see where is the mouth to the underground entrance. And if you go under there and walk for two or three miles underground and don't do that, because if you get lost, you'll never get back out. You come to right under here where one of those 16 Arhants live. And this is the one to whom Buddha transmitted the Pragna Paramita Sutras. So Nagarjuna came there, went under there, and that's where he received the Pragna Paramita teachings from the Nagas or from the this one of the 16 Anhats. So very, very beautiful stupa was built there later and maintained until today with a bunch of little temples around it. And, you know, if you went there in 1960, there were just a few little villages living there and all of those houses you see below, that was all still farmland. It was with later years and Kathmandu went from being a, you know, having 150,000 people living in it to now having about two and a half million people living in the Kathmandu Valley. So beautiful little mountain. And if you have time, if you go early in the morning, 
or sometime if you're going again, stay in the Vajra Hotel near there. That whole mountain has, a, over the last 20 years, various uh, Himalayan kingdom people settling in Kathmandu have built a beautiful walkway around the base of that whole mountain. It takes about two hours to walk around it. You do a complete circumambulation around the whole thing and you come out in the front and you walk up the 365 steps coming up and you each, each step purifies one uh, day from the last year. So between now and you go, anyone you want to assassinate, any banks you want to rob, any women, <laughs> any women you want to have sex with, et cetera, do that quickly and then uh, walk up those 365 steps and any negative karma collected in the last year are all, or if you're like me, you know, 72 years old, uh, you'll run, uh, go there and just stay in a nearby hotel, which I did one year. And for 72 days, 70 times, I walked up and down those stairs. So everything since this life was completely purified right back from the beginning. And that is why today I am as pure as the driven snow in the ship of Antarctica. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so delighted to hear that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to just, I, I really like to just jump right into Vajrayogini because I, I know this is a really so this powerful. Is, uh, right. So this is Padmasambhava's Enlightenment Cave in Paraping. Now, if it really is or isn't, we don't know because... Uh, <clears throat> It was not so designated until Tibetans came here, came into exile in 59. It was not so designated by locals, but Tibetans claim that it was and that always had been seen as such. And therefore the great Trungpa Rinpoche, who was the sort of senior most Karma Kargyu Lama, built this temple, got managed to get this land directly outside the cave and build this temple uh, monastery right there. And you can still rent rooms in this for doing retreats and stuff like that. And uh, you can go inside. It's a very small little cave. You can only sit like three people or something like that in it. But according to belief, this is where Padmasambhava achieved enlightenment. Roughly, you know, 725 or 730 AD. And uh, yeah, so it's a very, very powerful place even if it's not his enlightenment cave if you're uh, if you don't follow that myth anyway many great masters have come and meditated there those of you who've seen the movie i worked on with mark winberg and keith dowman and others called the uh, precious guru uh, on the life of padmasambhava we did quite a big sh uh, shoot up there this was sort of a focal point of it we started making that film in mongolia the sort of Nyingma treasure revelation sites in Mongolia, then went into Tibet and up to Mustang and then down to Ahir and then over to Bhutan, sort of covering the main keys to Padmasambhava's life, if you will. So beautiful. So what well, the name of it again, was it, Lama? Precious Guru. Wonderful. So here's the Vajragini. I'm just going to flash ahead and then you can go, we'll go back. I just want you to see what we have here. This is the Sanku Temple with the Vajragini. This is the one that's uh, the Vajragini temple near near Swayambu. And then there's one Vajragini temple in Patan. And there's one Vajragini temple in Parping. This is the one in Parping. So any any comments on Vajragini and any right. associ so any associations on these temples in specific and as a practitioner also help us whether we've taken empowerment of Vajragini or not, what might we be able to do once we land on these sites? How would you prepare us? Right. So for Tibetans, the three, the three big forms of Vajrayogini are the lineages coming from uh, Naropa. So this is here known as Naropa's Vajrayogini, Naropa Kachitma, Naropa's Kachari in Sanskrit on the left. That's the one on the left. And so Naropa gave that not to Marpa, but gave it to the Pamtingpa brothers from Nepal. And they came back and meditated in Parping and achieved enlightenment there. And later, uh, early Sakya masters, because Parping, Nepal is kind of on the road 
you could say, between Bodh Gaya and Sakya. And so they very deeply inspired all of Southern Tibet's tradition. And uh, of course, Galupa with the first Dalai Lama's monastery in Shigatse, also the next closest Indo-Nepali city is Kathmandu. So that was again, very big on the trade route. In fact, when Tashi Lumbo was built in the mid 1400s, I think the main building completed in 1447, the first Dalai Lama brought many of the great artists, painters, statue makers from, from uh, Parping, uh, from, uh, from Kathmandu, from Lalitpur, as it was known in Buddhism, the place of great enlightenment theater, which is modern day Patan. So that one is the, that's the Vajrayogini one. The one on the right is the uh, in Maitripa, the Mahasiddha Maitripa. So she's sort of seen like flying, you could say. Often this one is used in the uh, six yogas of Niguma for Poa. She's right above your head like this and her vagina is caressing the top of your skull hair so that when you're dying, you imagine yourself in your navel chakra as the Atung and you look up and there you see like a tunnel going up to a skylight and you look up out of the skylight and there is uh, the Vajra Yogini and there is her vagina and this sort of deep sense of, I want to reach, yikes, I'm dying. I want to return to the womb of the mother. <laughs> Mm. This very deep sort of Freudian instinct kicks in. And uh, so then we immediately go, go hick, 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 and we throw our consciousness up from the navel tractor to the heart, heart to throat, throat to crown, and crown out through the crown aperture into the birth passage of Vajrayogini and up into her womb. And now we're safely back in the womb. And the womb, of course, in Buddhism represents the female vagina, represents total open-minded uh, wisdom, quality of conscious, which is totally open-minded and ungrasping, ungrasping open-mindedness. And the womb represents the nature of infinity or ultimate reality. In other words, we pass beyond. And uh, of course, uh, the the caress of the vagina is a, for both men and women alike is a very blissful sensation. And so then we have bliss, openness and infinity. Those three qualities come together and uh, it's a nice way to go. Beautiful. Oh, and six yogas of Niguma, that's a very strong practice. Yeah, so this is again the Naroka Chitma. This is the Naropa by can see it correctly, seems to be the Naropa form. So again, that's the Pamtingpa Brothers Temple up in Parping. And you know, that's certainly my favorite of the three biggies that are in Nepal. But you know, there's 18 forms of Vajrayogini. Uh, Elizabeth, I can't remember her last name out of England did a book on that. Yes. And uh, Keith Dalman's book may have most of those listed, I don't remember. But for Tibetans, the three big ones are just um, the Pamtingpa brothers, the Maitripa, and the Indrabhuti form. So this form, the one with the legs open and the flying above your head with the sort of vagina caressing the top of your death, death canal, as a channel as it's known in Tibetan. And the, the one of Mahasiddha Indrabhuti, where he's standing on, she's standing on one foot and in meditation on the other and dancing on the one foot. So mm -hmm. those are the three biggies in Tibet. And they're often they're called outer inner secret, but I don't, it's kind of silly to use that name, but Tibetans like to throw that onto almost everything because all three of them can be outer inner secret or all three have outer inner secret forms. Mm -hmm. And in uh, terms, so, of, right? And in terms of practices, I mean, doing any of the Vajrayogini sadhanas are good, or just do the the Vajrayogini mantra. And uh, if you go to the Parping one, the Triple Om mantra, Om 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 Sarvabhutkini Yavasmani Yavasrusni, etc. Any of those mantras, or you can just do Chakra Sambhaja, Chakra Sambara, simple mantra, Om Shri Vajrahe Ruru Kam Hum Hum Petakini Jala Sambara, and so on. Yeah, so this is the Sangu Temple, I believe, right? 
Yeah, this is Sunku. I believe this, I, I, if I understand correctly, this is the oldest one of the Vajragini temples. It won't be much different. If it is older, it's probably just a couple of decades. And uh, they, uh, they, it sustained some damage during the recent earthquake, but hopefully I think they've, they've restored some of it. Uh, so it's, I think we, we are planning to visit it again. Right. Yeah, I, there's a kind of an amazing Vajra Yogini there. A friend of mine did a, her a three-week Vajra Yogini retreat up there. And she said it was amazing. The last, it hadn't rained, it didn't rain at all during her whole retreat. And the last day as she was, as she was there, so this one is, is, is often can, it's often said it can talk to you. Hmm. So if you. Meditate there, you may hear some whispering of words as though Vajra Yogini is talking to you. So she was doing it uh, on her last day of her retreat. She said it was very amazing. She was looking up and a big tear started forming from the eye and rolled down the cheek. It's beautiful. You know, the word for a statue in Tibetan is ten, ten. Um, and the ten means uh, a vessel, vessel. So it's not the metal, it's not the artistry, but once a, once a statue or a tanka painting is completed, a rabne or a consecration ritual is done. Rabne literally means best place ritual is done. And the enlightenment forces are called into that. So therefore, it is no longer just a statue or an image, but rather it is a receptacle holding the actual enlightenment force, much in the way of a living being carries the soul of that being until as long as that being is still alive. So then if they want to, say, renovate something or do some work on it, they'll do a ritual in which they send the enlightenment force, they deconsecrate it, if you will, <laughs> mm. uh, send the enlightenment force back out. Then they'll scratch off some of the gold and do the, do the restoration work and then rip, put the gold paint back on and so forth, and then do a reconsecration ritual. So I, I'm a big believer, you could say, from personal experience of myself and dear friends, that if you have the sense of Buddhist icons or idols, if we want to, let's use the word idol in the sense of I really idolize, <laughs> rather than the negative sense of like, like a, you know, idol worship, which is kind of a Muslim, uh, well, the three Semitic religions all kind of put down idol worship because they wanted uh, to promote the idea of of the formless nature of God. But God has to also, if you go to Christianity or Judaism or Islam, also has to manifest in the world in ways that can be perceived. Being formless is kind of useless. If it can't do anything in the world of form, it's like, yeah, that's wonderful gun you got there. No bullets? Great. Oh, well, let's hope the person believes it's loaded because otherwise uh, you're not going to do well in that. Someone who brings a knife to a gunfight with you is probably going to win. <laughs> Even a baseball battle that you are. So the idea of the idea of an image as ten as a vessel or a conduit of enlightenment energy, we could say a window into a sacred realm or a sacred world. We could also say a fountain head from which the rivers or uh, forces of enlightenment can flow freely and easily into the ordinary human world. So when you sit there and meditate there, you can have a very profound sense of the power of such energy. Mm. Let me just ask you, since you mentioned the Parping one, um, and you know, we'll we'll wrap up here in a second. I just want to um, sort of get a more detailed sense of the approach into a temple, technically or practically speaking, when you lead your groups. I, I imagine you don't just go straight up into the shrine room. So, you know, what's the attitude? What's the formality? What's the custom? Uh, what do you bring with you? How do you perform, you know, your entrance into the, uh, into the, into the sanctum there? Right. 
you know, most uh, temples in Asia have this little sort of courtyard outside. And if we look upstairs in those three windows, that's where the inner sanctum is. And that's where the sacred Vajrayogini uh, vessel is kept. So I would usually with my groups, we'd sit down here and uh, wait for the Pandaji to come to the window and then say, oh, oh namaste Pandaji, sabdi take. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, well, in case other people are up there. And as you see on the left here, there's a little door that goes on and people leave their shoes down there and you hope they're still there when you come out and they usually so far are. Otherwise you can do what Tibetans did is you leave one of your shoes there and you run around the back of the temple and leave the other one at the back of the temple. So <laughs> anyone, only a one-legged person would consider stealing the shoe and only if he's one leg is the same foot as the one that's in front of him. <laughs> but when, if the Pandaji invites you up, and they have their own circumambulation path. And although in Chakra Sambara and female Tantra, you should circumambulate counterclockwise, this is only done secretly. So actually here, the circumambulation path takes you clockwise around the main little um, house, main little room, chamber, holding the sacred image of Vajra Yogini which is there from the time of the Pramtingpa brothers. And the right where you see those three windows, you can sit 10 or 12 people along that area. And sometimes, usually the Pandaji will sit off to the side. And uh, if you go back into it and go over to the right, that's where they have a kind of a bigger room. And if people stay overnight, they'll take a little bedroll and uh, or whatever and stretch out and you can sleep there overnight and just do the practice. Now they do lock the thing obviously at night with the with the sacred image inside because they don't want treasure stealers, thieves, um, temple thieves to steal things. Uh, but then, then at the end, if you sit there and if you teach everyone to do one mantra, whatever it is, but it's good if you do have the triple ohm mantra as known and everyone does that, then the Pandaji will be very impressed and very relaxed and it can consider you one of the family, the Vajra Yogini family. And how do you, how do you, how do you handle that when uh, not everybody's initiated? How do you, how, how do you, well, just, just say you is it it's just simply a blessing? Is it sort of a karmic yeah. connection? Yeah, to say if you want to participate, participate. If you want to do the mantra, do the mantra. If you don't want to do the mantra, just sit down and pretend to do the mantra, move your mouth, mouth and say, Hail Mary, Mother of God. It's an oranges which popped out of your womb. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, my, my aunt-in-law came on one of my trips and she's a strong Catholic and she said, Glenn, I would love to go on one of your trips to Nepal and Tibet and the Buddhist places, but I'm very strong Catholic and I'm just going to do Hail Marys wherever I go. And I said, well, of course, so we don't care what you do and they don't care what you do. And, uh, you know, just be respectful and whatever. And if you want to wait outside anywhere, you can wait outside. If you want to come in and sit with us, you can sit with us. It's your choice. And sometimes she would just sort of wander around looking like a little old lost lady she was in her late 70s or early 80s and can easily at that age one can not unlike a young youthful 72 year old me those old people in their late 70s or early 80s can easily look a little bit lost <laughs> <laughs> anyway she would wander around doing her hail marys and she had a wonderful time so you know there's nothing wrong with people doing without empowerment but uh I don't think the Pandaji minds. It's kind of a nice karmic connection, at least as a cultural experience. But if they prefer to sit down in the courtyard and just sit down there doing their own little, whatever it is they do, you know, if they're on the stock market, they can go on the on their uh, smartphone and trade some stocks while you're up there and see if, see if being near the temple brings. I, I highly doubt the people on this trip will do that. <laughs> You never know. I got, one, I got one student down in Florida 
uh, you know, he asked me to give him a teaching the other day, and we're talking, and, I, and he's, he's getting the teaching, and he looks, oh, Glenn, the stock market and blah, blah, is just opening in three minutes. <laughs> We take this break from the six yogas in the Broadway for just 10 minutes. I'm like, yeah, I'm <laughs> so that, that was a fantastic ride, Glenn. I just want to ask uh, in closing here the if there's any advices that you'd like to share with your students before they travel and after they travel, because oftentimes with pilgrimage, the orientation towards is... Uh, it pales in comparison to what what re-entry is like coming back from a pilgrimage. I remember the first time I went to Bodh Gaya, I was 20 years old. I spent five months there, and it was, it was hard going there in 1994. Uh, no cell phones, no internet, no nothing, uh, staying in the Burmese Vihar. It was very transformative, very powerful. Um but the re-entry back, I remember, was very challenging. I landed back at college almost like an, I felt so alien. And it was very difficult to reintegrate. People would ask, how was your trip? But you, and they'd always ask in the kind of way where it was, you know, they wanted just the elevator sort of pitch. And even the elevator pitch would just have been, you know, anathema to them, un, un, unrecognizable. Uh, so I, when you take your tours, if you want to close with just some advice about preparing and returning, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. Well, I think uh, one aspect I always recommend to any of my pilgrims is uh, if you're going to Nepal or Himalayas, that you have a nice pair of walking boots with ankle supports and uh, that you wear them for a month before going uh, for say take a half hour walk once or twice a day in them for a month or so before going because breaking in such boots or shoes when on pilgrimage getting blisters at the beginning of a pilgrimage is not good and Himalayas a lot of these paths are a little bit stony and lots of steps so you want them with a nice ankle support and a, a nice grip on the nice sole on the bottom so that you don't slip and slide all over the place Obviously, India is going to be different, Bagaya and those places, because that's flatland. But wherever you go in Nepal, you're in the Himalayas. So you're either walking up something steep or down something steep. Only probably when you're in the Bodhanat, when you first arrive, is probably the only non-high, uh, high, high up or down walk you're going to do. I also, um, you know, most of my pilgrimages also go to either Tibet or Bhutan, both of which, well, Tibet, they're always between 12 and 18,000 feet up. So to uh, do a little bit of walking on an up and down incline, wherever you live, if there's a place with a hill, walk up and down it for 20 minutes twice a day. A lot of people like Stairmasters. The problem with Stairmasters is you don't strengthen your downhill walking. One problem with walking up, you have to come down. <laughs> And that's been a big problem with people who won't follow that advice because you take a walk up to, you know, Taksang in Bhutan and it's a, you know, three hour walk up. You can come down in an hour and a half or two hours, but halfway down, if your muscles for stepping down and bringing your momentum to a halt aren't strong halfway down, you get very wobbly. So, uh, yeah, a good pair of shoes with good ankle supports, I think, is very important. Clothes, uh, layers are important when you're walking. You want to be able to take them off and put them on. You want to have a kind of a backpack or a pack where you can put those layers in quite comfortably when walking. And uh, also carry some sipping water, drinking water. And don't drink a lot. You have to pee, pee, pee a lot. You just, like, take a sip every 15 minutes, you take a little sip while you're on pilgrimage. It's a very good thing to do. So I think those physical, practical, trying to have a sense. One thing that irritates me with Americans is wherever they, when you're pilgrimage with Americans, wherever you go, they're always, this looks just like Utah, or this is like my holiday in Alaska. Try and drop the letting your mind take you back to somewhere that looks like a remotely like it. Try to be here now, as Ram Dass puts it in one of his books. 
uh, the title of one of his books, Try and Rest and Relax Into That. And uh, yeah, to try to be meditative as you walk. So when Tibetans uh, do pilgrimage, they're always doing a mantra, Om Mani Padme Hum, or Om Tare Tutare Ture Sohar, whatever is our favorite bodhisattva practice. And otherwise, just if you're a Catholic, do, do Hail Marys. If like me, you were born an Anglican, you go, God save our gracious queen, God let her live. And obviously our song to the queen is working. I mean, she's uh, well up into her 90s now and still out walked Donald Trump when he walked with her. Uh, he had to start running to get in front of her. <laughs> but uh, to try to keep us a uh, spiritual presence and not just be like a tourist wandering through, you know, museums of Europe kind of thing on guided tours and really be touch to the spiritual energy. And I think each place like that, um, be careful. I always recommend that people take their own bowl and their own cup. Most people who get Delhi belly or Montezuma's revenge traveling in foreign places, don't get it from the food. They get it from the dirty dish on which the food was served. So people will be in a place with no potable water but then they'll wash the plates and the knives and forks and spoons under the tap and that water isn't good. Or, uh, you know, they'll wipe, wipe your plate with a dirty rag or they'll look at your spoon and it won't be clean. They'll go and they clean it off while they're carrying it to your table. So monks in, in, from the time of Buddha, every, you know, when we say monk in the West, we think it's a celibate, but actually in India, it was a Kim Mavis, a, someone wandering with the Buddha for a, a month or two months or three months or however long, should bring their own bedroll, their own bowl, their own cup, their own spoon. And the reason for that is when you're eating, you don't want to catch whatever disease is in the water or whatever. Food cooked is always 99.9999999% chance it's healthy and non-toxic. If there's bacterias or deli belly bacterias in it, it's coming from either the water with which the plate or the spoon was washed and not properly dried or was dried with the dirty cloth that was used to wipe up something from the floor <laughs> when they picked, spilled something on the floor. So I think that's important. Uh, to get over jet lag and to uh, you know, reintegrate your life, get your body back up to uh, scratch, so to speak, then um, that should do it. In terms of uh, a lot of people take things to give away to little kids in valleys and stuff like that. Don't give anything away when you arrive or everywhere you go, you're gonna have beggars following you everywhere radically. So with my groups in Tibet, if they bring things, I always tell them, when we leave, you can give out things. Don't give anything when you arrive or you'll just be, you'll just be harassed for the whole trip. I often will take one of those like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Wombs kind of whips with me especially parping and those uh, places in Nepal where you get these sellers trying to sell you flags to hang, prayer flags to hang up and all these things and crack the whip a few times. And I don't let them walk beside any of the women because that's not allowed in Asia. They think they can get away with it with Western people and just like completely harass the women into buying some of their goods buy this it's only only three please I have had no sale and you're there on pilgrimage and there's just these people so I don't let anyone walk near me when I'm with them. I'm really tough with them and I take a whip and I crack it. Uh, if they don't listen well, they get it uh, along the, the derriere on the behind and sitting down for a week is a little, a little sensitive, we could say. <laughs> and you do it so joyously at that llama. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's call, it's, let's call it a day. And, yeah, it was a wonderful tour. I mean, it was almost like a mini pilgrimage just ha chatting with you. The time has disappeared. I want to always thank you so much for sharing so your time, your experience, your heart, your good cheer, your joy, all your stories. So thank you so much for leading us through that pilgrimage, uh, uh, Lama Glenn Mullen. Thank you for being on the Wisdom Keeper podcast. Until next time. <laughs> Ta-ta for now. <laughs>
Thank you for listening to the Wisdom Caper podcast. If you've enjoyed this presentation of sacred knowledge, kindly like, subscribe, review, and share our podcast and video series on YouTube with your network so that more people can benefit from these teachings and together we can create a brighter future. If you're interested in my online courses, our community membership, and pilgrimages I lead, consider visiting the Contemplative Studies program at gradualpath.com. Until we gather again, all best wishes.